Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today on this happy Friday morning, and we are so excited to chat to you about facing the gentle giants of Africa, the mountain gorilla. With us today, I have Lee and Manette. Please say hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> hi, everyone. Amazing. Um, today, obviously, we're going to be chatting to you about gorilla trekking, and this is a really fascinating topic. Our consultant, Minette, has actually been on a gorilla trek before. She's lived in Uganda. She's been a guide. So she's very knowledgeable. And of course, we have Lee joining us, who is just as knowledgeable and is here to answer any of the questions you have. Just a reminder that we have a Q&A chat box where you can ask your questions and we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Without further ado, let's get cracking, ladies. How are you guys feeling? Good, excited. Oh, so, excited. <laughs> it's just the heads up, I'm going to try and not talk too much because when I get excited, I just like, ah, can't stop. <laughs> Nick is very chatty, everybody. She loves to talk, but don't worry, we will hopefully not keep you for too long. <laughs> keep, we need to, we'll just keep you on track, minutes. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> Awesome. So I guess the first question, Minette, is what do you love so much about gorilla trekking and why should somebody experience that? You know, it's a, it, that is a really good question. And the day when I started my track, I don't think it actually quite hit me yet, to be honest. Um, the walk itself is incredible. It's not just the gorillas. The, the, I mean, you're walking in a rainforest. But when you see that first gorilla, I, I literally, I just got goosebumps. Um, the overwhelming emotion you feel that, oh my gosh, I'm in the presence of these incredible, magnificent animals. And it's just like, the emotion washes over you because you feel so blessed that you're in their presence. Um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and they are an endangered species. And while you have the opportunity and you get the chance here in Africa, do it. Don't don't even hesitate. Yes, it's pricey. Um, but if you can do it, do it. I mean, you know, it's definitely worth it. It's just it, it, the emotions. It's just incredible being in presence with these guys. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. Um, and what would you say would be your most memorable encounter when you were on a gorilla trek? Like what sticks out for you? What, what really sets it in motion for you to be like, okay, cool. This is what I went through. This is what I experienced. And yeah. So when I was on the hike, I was sitting on, I mean, you, depending on the family you go and visit, the, you know, the hike and the terrain that you walk in change and it can be quite challenging especially when it's been raining and the floor of the forest is wet but when you finally see that family so for me I was on a on quite a steep slope so I kind of like had to hang on a tree or a branch just to keep my footing but I was a meter from a silverback and it was just the size of those fingernails <laughs> so it's like little pork sausages the hands it was and uh, so it was just being there with him. And then he turned around and looked at me and I was like, <laughs> you know, but it was like, oh, hi. Like I'm part of like one of his family and I've just come to say hi. That was incredible that he didn't find me as a threat and he just looked at me and then carried on eating his, you know. Then, when you describe that, did you feel scared at any point or was it just more? No, pumping? not at all. The adrenaline, my heart was pumping so fast because you only get given an hour. Um, once you reach the family, you need to put your masks on, the gorilla family, and you sit there for an hour. You've got to be quiet, no loud noises, no sudden movements. And, um, and as long as you follow the guide's instructions, you're going to be absolutely okay. Um, you were the trackers and the rangers that follow these gorillas every single day. And these guys are quite familiar with the mannerisms of the gorillas and how they work. And if they find, you know, all right, I need to alert, we need to move away, then 
you know, just based on one of the gorilla's mannerisms, then they would move the group to a, you know, a safer place. But it's it's never really brought up. It's never really been an issue. Um, never problems have happened. With, as long as you listen to your guide and follow everything that he says and does. That's the same with any safari, really. No, actually, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a wild animal. And, you know, you do need to respect and be quiet. Like you can imagine any sudden movement or a loud noise is not natural for them. So they're going to be alert and you don't want to really do that per se. I mean, I've had stories, uh, one of my travelers like 20 odd years ago, she went gorilla trekking and she emailed me that night and she's like, you're not going to believe what happened. I was just sitting viewing, you know, this family of gorillas and the mum came past and plopped the baby in my lap. <laughs> oh, yeah, so the baby sit the baby while mum went off to feed. I was like, oh my god. Maybe mum had two babies and she's like, I need to look after the one. <laughs> no, and I need the break. The <laughs> no, absolutely. But you know, you never know what you're gonna get. You never know if you're gonna get a little boisterous teenager that just like pummels his fists on his chest, just enjoying the moment. And that hour you get with them goes by so fast. Like you need to also remember to stop and just take in and enjoy the moment like i had a video camera here i had my phone here it was stills and this was me <laughs> that half my footage is awful eh? because i was like so overwhelmed being in these presents that i was just like trying to take it all in at once with a camera film and then still trying to look um just don't mm -hmm. forget to enjoy the moment because it goes by so quickly Definitely. I think that's what any safari experience, like sometimes you have to just put the camera down and just sit back and realize where you are. That's mm. 100%, 100%. Get your one shot and put the camera down. Yeah. You only need one. Yeah, <laughs> much like if you I mean, someone. You don't want different. to be having your safari through the lens of a camera the whole yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Good you point. want to actually enjoy it and see it as well. Definitely, definitely. I guess probably the first question I actually should have asked is what yeah. exactly is gorilla trekking? What is gorilla trekking? <laughs> for, those, so, for those who don't know. Why do they call it trekking? Right. So gorilla trekking is an activity, this is an excursion that gives you an opportunity to see one of the most incredible beasts, if I could say per se. Um, incredible animals in our world um, that are endangered and often the most incredible destinations have rather interesting journeys um, some of the best destinations include a challenging journey so the gorilla trekking can be challenging you are hiking in a rainforest a lot of it is quite easy to walk but then you know you're going to get to points where you need to go up a steep black ravine sort of thing and then you just got to climb up so it's a lot of up and down you're literally climbing up a volcano in search a high volcano a high mountain in search of gorillas um so it's the terrain and we don't know where the families are um until yeah. the moment you track because we don't know where they've rested the night before so that's up to the trackers um your track can take anything from 20 minutes up to four, five, six hours, depending where the family is. My track, we tracked for about two hours. So a lot of it was on a normal path, and then we'd have to break off into the bush terrain. The head guides will have pangas just to cut the bush so that it's easy for you to walk through. Um, and then once you see we get to the family, you get to have one hour with them. And then after that, they will find the closest path to exit um, the park that you are tracking in. And quite often, it's not nearly as long as the uh, trek coming in. Um, quite often, it's just a little quick path, 30 minutes up and you're at a lodge in the middle of Windy. And then, hey, ho, your vehicle's there to pick you up. So it's not necessarily that you're going to walk back with two or six hours. Um, it all depends where the family is and where you're going to be tracking. But it is an incredible activity. Um, it is also offered in Rwanda, um, a little bit more pricier there. But, you know, it's a different country, different government, different rules. So their prices are slightly different as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Manette. And 
obviously like you know understanding our career tracking is great but what do you need to know before before you decide to take on career tracking like what's involved in booking something like that um are there permits etc so yeah right so a couple of things in order for you to go gorilla tracking we need to buy a gorilla permit and the only way to do this is to pay it in full um we have supplies and operators on the ground in uganda that will then either travel by hand to the uganda wildlife authority office or there are only certain specialized companies in Uganda that are allowed to sell permits. So a lot of the operators we use have their set bases in Uganda already who pre-purchase um, the, uh, the permits for you. In order to purchase a permit, we do need your full name and passport number as per the passport you're traveling on. So your permits are booked according to this passport information. So if you get down the day and your passport information doesn't match what's on your gorilla tracking permit, they won't let you track. So it's vitally important that you give us the correct um, information for this. Quite often when people are booking a tour, they're like, oh, my passport expires in a couple of months. I'm getting a new one before the tour. That's absolutely fine. Once you do have your new updated passport info, please just do send it across. So that's the major thing in terms of just securing your gorilla permit. For the track itself, it's quite important to realize that an element of fitness is required. Um, you know, you don't need to be no Olympian or a person that goes to gym every day. I don't go to gym every day. Stand <laughs> up, you will see that. <laughs> but just, you know, general health, just for um, stamina more than anything else. So if you can just practice by going walking around a couple of blocks every day after work, and then each day just walk another block and another block and see, right, how quicker can I do these blocks? And, mm -hmm. step by step. and that in itself will be enough to prepare you for your gorilla tracking. Um, in terms of gear and what to wear, so good, comfy, grippy shoes. A lot of people will say, you know, the good ankle hiking boots. So if you have wonky ankles, um, we used to call them wankles. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so if you have a tendency where your feet can swerve and slip, mm -hmm. then absolutely 100% get something that will support your ankles because some of the hikes can be challenging, especially if the forest floor is wet um, you are tracking in a rainforest so it can rain at any given time whether it's dry season or rain season the forest has its own um, weather pattern so if it's going to rain you need to be prepared for it so when you are going on a track um, comfortable shoes so I just wore off-road trail trainers and that was absolutely fine for me however if you want something a bit more grippy by all means especially if you're doing a longer tour through Africa if you're going to be hiking Mount Kilimanjaro or Fishery Canyon use those same boots it's absolutely fine another thing that's really handy to have is gardening gloves I know it sounds quite random, but when you're walking and you lose your balance, it's instinct just to put your hand out and grab a branch just to like steady yourself. Some of these branches might have thorns on or bugs or nettles. So, you know, that's where it comes handy is just to grip yourself. You don't hurt and you're really just protecting your hands. So you don't need anything thick or bulky, nice and thin. You're not going to get these in your banda. You'll get like welding gloves, big bulky things. If you forget to pack them in, honestly, I didn't even track with gloves, but um, it is handy for those who have um, quite sensitive hands. So that's pretty epic to have. Another really cool tip is just good old fashioned energy sweeties. So, you know, your glucose sweets that you carry, mm -hmm. um, carry those with you because you're tracking, you're in a rainforest, it's humid. Ladies, you'll be perspiring, men, you'll be sweating. <laughs> and you kind of need to replenish yourselves, your liquids as well as um, natural salts in your body. Because when you're sweating, you're releasing all these salts and you're not replacing it. So sometimes not even water is enough. So definitely water, but glucose so it seriously goes a long way. Um, and then a light rain jacket because it can rain at any time and you'd like to protect your camera gear. So that will be super helpful. Lastly, 
um, you do have the option to take a porter. I do recommend this for various reasons. Mm -hmm. You may be the fittest person in the world going, no, I can do this myself. I can do it with my backpack. Yeah, that's great. But these guys only get the opportunity to be a porter, I think once a month or once every 40 days, they don't get a salary. So the only income they have is what you pay them to carry your bag for you. But they're also there to help you. I mean, I couldn't have done it without my porter because he pushed my butt up a really high like ravine thing. There was no way I was going to get up there without him. I was like, you've got to help me here, buddy. So, <laughs> and, it was you made him work for his money then. Made him work for his money. Yeah, yeah, shame, poor guy. But I also had them laughing a lot, um, which wasn't very good. I think anybody who has an encounter with you will laugh a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Minette, now you, you're talking about the porters and stuff. Are they available at the lodges? Do they wait for... Yeah, yeah, so what they'll do is not necessarily at the lodges. You'll find them at the Gorilla Trek start point. So they're all there in the morning. So when you leave your lodge or your camp where you stay, it's about a two-hour drive, depending. So where I was, I was based in Lake Quignoni. So a lot of overland trucks will be departing for the um, Gorilla Trek from there. It's a two-hour drive to the Gorilla Trek start point. Um, so once you get to the Gorilla Trek start point, you have a brief mean about your gorilla trek it's also where you're going to meet your rangers your guides and the porters um so the porters are there you can choose one and they'll just carry your bag so you don't need to get one at the camp you just need you get one at the start of the trekking point with that said you just need to make sure you bring enough cash with you for the tipping and this is often a little bit of a confusing um a topic um because mm -hmm. you never know exactly how many rangers and guides and trekkers and you're gonna have on your track but i would say one two three four about five or six you need to budget for so you have your head ranger you have the security police per se you have uh, trackers and you've got guides so um the, each one have various levels for tipping and by all means you know, we are happy to send this information through to you by mail because to talk about it, it can be quite overwhelming. But just for example, for the tracker, so the guides, the rangers all have monthly salaries, just so that you know, um, but it is customary to tip. For the porter, he doesn't. So he gets about 80,000 shillings. This is equivalent to about $20, $25 for the day. It's really not too much when you think what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's the only day you can work you know, over the next month sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely worth, because not only are you supporting him and a family, you know, and putting bread and butter on their table, but it's also just making your track that much more enjoyable. So, um, also, I was just thinking of something, because, you know, like permits, they only issue a certain number of days, and you certain Correct. number of people go in. So, how does that work? extra people like do the porters and stuff because obviously they're not buying permits do they get like certain access because they're local to the area no so what happens is they don't have to pay naturally but they're only there to help you on the walk so when you so when stop you, yes point so when okay. the trackers have found the gorilla family you kind of stop you put your mask on um so my tracker held my bag for me and i just went to the family with my camera and they stayed back so it was only the trackers the head guide and us as eight people mm -hmm. that were, were the gorillas all the porters and the others stayed at the back um, and what's the difference between a tracker and a guide so your guide is usually a uganda wildlife authority ranger guide they've studied they have qualifications um they also give you information on the fauna and flora of the area you know so they're guiding you through the process the trackers are the guys that pretty much stay with the gorillas 24 7 per se um keeping an eye on them and just following them from a distance um and i stand under correction but sometimes these will be the same trackers that were with them when they did their habituation um so this would mean that 
a total wild gorilla that is not used to humans or having any form of interaction with humans. They go through a habituation process so that they can be used to, um, you know, humans per se, and then only are they then allowed or introduced as a family for gorilla trekking per se, because then they're used to um, humans and they won't necessarily run away. With the habituation, it's a much longer, harder, and a lot more expensive because you're on the go constantly. Mm -hmm. It's not like you see your family and you can sit and just enjoy and watch them for an hour. These guys are not familiar with humans, and so they see you, they scare, and they just keep moving. So it's constant. It's all the way. Is there, is there a higher risk with maybe a habituation from the fact that they're not so used to people or you say that they just move away? I'm not sure. It's a really good question. We'd have to probably touch base with the professionals, you know, in Uganda, but it is a complete different experience and yeah. something that you need to be um, more open-minded about. I personally haven't done the habituation. Um, I'm also not familiar with any stories or any situations that have happened. I just know that you won't get to enjoy peacefully sitting with the family yes. of gorillas with the habituation. No, that's um, how I understand it, that they just move. Yeah, they're just on the move the whole time. They're not used to you, so they're just going to keep moving and get away from you because you're unfamiliar. But do you kind of have, um, what is it, like a scientist or wildlife expert because they're studying them? Or something like that. That's well, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, well, I guess it also depends on um, who you're going to be trekking with, but I'm not 100% sure of that, so I don't really want to quite answer. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to check for sure. But you do have the rangers that are working with these guys 24-7 that are staying with them, and you do have guides that move with you. Um, it could just be that the guys that are researching them, they may be there on the day or they may not be there on the day. And if they are, they might join you, depending how many people are in the group. Um, and my common sense would tell me that they take less people on a habituation than they would on a standard gorilla trip. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you, Martha. Sure. Like, I think I need to double check, actually. That's a good question. No, no, I think I think you're right. I think there's four permits a day or something, um, yeah. as opposed to like you could get like eight or double the amount of a normal trip. Yeah, because the yeah, standard you really you can have eight people per family, but there's also a lot of families out there. I mean, you know, they are breeding a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was there, the family that I was tracking is a new one. So they're part of one of the bigger family groups and um, silverback, you know, started his own family with another female and then when the baby was born they decided to break off and start their own little family um so this is how there are so many families because when it gets too big or it's like i'm moving out of home kind of yeah <laughs> like, bye, bye i will see you later i'm starting my own thing yeah, yeah it's sort of yeah. like that. So yeah. it's just family. It's like that one series on tlc where they like swap swap families Oh, the wasp. Oh, yes. Yes. That yes. yes, that's right. Oh my gosh, I used to love that program. It's so interesting that that happens in nature and it's it dynamic. Happens with humans. Exactly. <laughs> well, I was reading that gorillas have like ninety eight percent DNA or similar to people. Like they are like yes. the closest. Yes, yeah. and for this reason, we can pass on our diseases and sicknesses to them very easily. So it's so important to look That's after your health. Make sure you don't go do anything funny <laughs> um, before your gorilla trek. And please try not get the flu. <laughs> if you have a cough or a sneeze, they're not going to let you track. You were saying even hay fever can be an issue. Pardon? You, weren't you saying like even hay fever or well, somebody told me even hay fever can be an issue i'm like well hay fever would more be an allergy um yeah. i don't think it's a virus or a bacteria but yeah like i guess if they <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think hay fever maybe um, I might have said that one day just with one of my verbal diarrhea sessions <laughs> but um, no it's mostly that we can transfer sicknesses and diseases to them quite easily and they can catch it and the same with the chumps so um, 
it's important. That's why we have to wear masks when mm. you're in the presence of the gorillas. But even if you have a flu, they won't let you track. So I had a lady on my tour who, oh, I think she just got a case of the African belly. Uh, uh, 24 hour bug sort of thing and it just happened on the day she had to track and oh uh, you can't that you that's like because you'd be dehydrated and well it, it would have been a horrible and an awful experience but in this case she actually hired um and this is possible you can do this not a people a lot of people know it but you can actually be carried so you don't have to walk <laughs> so they put you in a chair sort of thing and you are carried by four men sort of pretty much up the mountain oh, wow. did she, did, did she do this that? needs to be pre-arranged so even people who are paralyzed um oh, yeah. there are opportunities it doesn't I mean, you can't can walk that you can't can. hike it is possible um pre-permission needs to be gotten it is expensive but it i mean if you can and you have the money and the budget freaking do it why not mm -hmm. everybody can yeah. yeah wow that's amazing like because you always think to yourself oh i can't go on a safari like if you are if you are you know paralyzed or if you've got that's something there are options yeah. i mean not a lot in east africa mm -hmm. but in southern africa oh my gosh there are companies that specialize um mm -hmm. safaris for anyone who's enabled on any level mm -hmm. um i've actually operated one I ran a trip where the truck was specially built to take wheelchairs. It's got a oh. little zzz, it in, zzz, the wheelchair goes in, and there were like little special locks where you can lock your wheelchair in, and it's super safe, and off we went. It was amazing, and it's just so beautiful being able to, you know, offer safaris for people who thought they never could either. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely going off another topic there. We've got to go back. But yeah, like there's no reason why nobody can't come. Yeah. Um, we might be a little bit more behind in terms of uh, tools and accessibility. Like the UK and Europe is phenomenal for wheelchair users. Like they can do skiing, scuba diving, the whole katuti. We're, we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. Lodges are definitely wheelchair accessible. A lot of them are, not all, um, but anything's possible. There's always a way. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you mention chimps. Could you explain yeah. what the difference is between gorilla trekking and chimp trekking? Because I assume you can't do them both on the same day. No, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Mishka. I think if I had to do the gorilla and the chimp trekking in one day, I don't think I'd ever able to walk again. <laughs> Only because I was on foot. <laughs> I wasn't fit enough. Like, you know, my um the stamina part so there is a, quite a difference i mean the terrain that you're tracking on the areas that you're tracking on are quite different i mean the forest floor for the chim tracking could be similar so the area that i did my chim tracking was in the greater murchison national park area in the bodongo eco forest reserve incredible very humid I found it more humid than the gorilla um, trekking. Maybe it was just the day and the season, anything like it can change. But the terrain, the floor that you were walking on was very much like this. Not climbing mm -hmm. per se, but it was a, a really uneven terrain and you're mm -hmm. crossing the river back and forth, back and forth. So what's interesting to note with the chumps is that these guys are constantly on the move. Yeah. So you have to, what made it hard for me is that you're hiking really fast, really, really fast to try and be in front of the chumps the whole time. So as they're coming, you're in front of them to get your photo while they're feeding. Um, so the, I, the the guides and the trackers are just trying to get you ahead of the chimps the whole time. Mm -hmm. And they know where the chimps are. They've just got to go by sound going right there, there, right. We've got to head this way. Come, we've got to go, we've got to go. And then it's like, oh, well, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> but then once you do see the family, it is phenomenal. You have five, ten minutes while they're just, you know, foresting on berries and things before they move on to the next tree. Mm -hmm. um, incredible it it's i literally felt like i was with my cousins 
in terms of they are so human-like in terms of looks and mannerisms. Not that gorillas aren't, but I found it a lot more with the chimps. They're mm. odd. Um, they screech a lot. They're brilliant and funny. Um, they're really cool. What, what other wildlife can you expect to see in Uganda apart from chimps and gorillas? Like what else is like what other party experiences and what's yeah. unique about it? Yeah. All right, so also this is area dependent. So like in Murchison, you have an incredibly high chance of seeing elephants, crocodile, and hippopotamus. Mm -hmm. Anything you see over above that is extra special on the bonus. Bird life is pretty phenomenal in Murchison, especially when you do the boat cruise on the Nile River to see the falls. It's so special. It's so beautiful. And... Um, yeah, it just depends on the luck of the day what you've seen. So I've seen subtle walks, mm -hmm. walks a whole various variety of birds, elephant just coming along, drinking all of the bags oh, amazing. on your cruise boat. It's pretty special. Um, you also get to see lots of different types of monkeys. Um, you've got red tails, you have fair vets, you have black monkeys, um, the golden monkey, and it's all really the luck on the day of what you get to see. Um, over and above that, like if you went to Queen Elizabeth National Park, um, the Shasha sector in the south is really well known for the tree climbing lions. And it's it's something that's pretty cool because it's the lions in this area just prefer to hang out in trees. You don't <laughs> see it as often like in Itosha or the Akavanga Delta or South Luangwa or the Mara where they're in trees. I mean, the odd time you do, but in Ishasha, most of the time they're in the trees and it's pretty epic to see. So you can do a game drive, um, an optional morning game drive. Some tours include one. Um, something that's really cool and special to see in Uganda that you won't necessarily see anywhere else is a shubal stalk. Oh, I was gonna uh, yeah. They are so cool with the <laughs> the little beaks going like the sound, the sound that they it's, make. Yeah, it yeah. is so cute. <laughs> so I've had the pleasure of meeting Sushi, the famous Shubal stalk in Uganda. <laughs> He's at Uwek. It's a Uganda Wildlife Education Center. And you can do a behind the scenes tour where you can go and meet Sushi. Mm -hmm. um, the stalk, and it's incredible because he interacts with you. So the guide will say, when you greet him, just shake your head, go down. So you go and you shake your head. And then here comes Sushi with his little head and also like doing a little shake greeting you. It's a pretty cool experience. So, so is that how the shoe bulls communicate with each other? Do they do that head shake? I think that's how they greet and talk. And yeah, it's a good thing. Um, they also like to be something that I remember with the shoe bulls talk is that they always like to be on a higher spot. So they could quite happily jump and stand on your shoulder like this tame guy and that could be quite hurtful they could make because he's because they're quite big those mm. claws man claws <laughs> so, look at this doesn't happen like so much if you have animal interactions but this is a you pay for it at the wildlife education center you go on behind the scenes and they might have oh i mean like um animals who are poached for argument's sake and there's babies you know, of the mum that was poached. Then it goes to the education centre, to the rehab. They rehabilitate them and eventually will then release them back in the wild. So they do a lot of incredible work with conservation, especially giraffes up in Murchison. Um, on that note, interesting fact, there's only one place in Uganda that you're going to find zebras. Okay. There's the Lake Kamburu. Okay. Is yeah, I can't find them in Queen Elizabeth or in Murchison. Do you have a reason for that? Like, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> I, know. I told you I'd be lying. She knows, she knows the facts. She doesn't know the reason. Yeah, <laughs> just, just the facts. It's just a fact. It's an interesting you know, fact. I don't know about Kidepra. I haven't been there. But, um, I'm talking about the yeah, conservation. Just, the only place you'll see zebras in Uganda is like Kumbura. That's interesting if for people that haven't seen, but I think once you've been through the rest of East Africa, you're going to have seen quite a few. But Minette, you know, you're talking about the the conservation and yes. um, and the and they rescue the babies and stuff. It just it brought back 
um, images, and I think we see it sometimes. We obviously share videos, but the Sheldrick Trust in, in Kenya, um, you know, oh, and I think oh, like if people oh, get the opportunity oh, in so, Africa, that's also something. Hundred percent. I think if I had to go to Sheldrick, I won't leave. Um, <laughs> I have a bit of a bleeding heart when it comes to that, and I'll be just like in there in the thick of it, sleeping with the baby rhinos or elephants or whatever it is. You know, give them all the love and the care that they need because they've just been through trauma. I would, but I'd be permanently broke if I did that. So, um, but yeah, it's incredible what they do. Speaking of the Sheldrick Trust, um, there's. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, Lee, because I'm going to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about them, that, you know, you need to pre-book um, your activity to go there, first of all, the Elephant Orphanage. Um, and if you, when you do that, you do it direct through the Sheldrake Wildlife Trust. Don't do it on, no offense to the trip advisors or, you know, through some safari companies offering it no it's a scam it's not allowed you are only allowed to book it in one place and that's direct with the sheldrick wildlife trust i mean i know on trip advisor you can but it's not valid you're going to get mm -hmm. them they're going to turn you away and it's very important to pre-book because uh, visiting hours to see the ellies are only at a certain time of day it's like a two-hour slot and they only allow a certain amount of people so it's vitally important to pre-book the activity to visit the elephant um orphanage in nairobi it looks it looks really a third party you will never be allowed entry it doesn't matter what the third party will say to you you can only do it direct it's good it's a good tip and yeah too many people are being scammed yeah just going back on you yeah. know conservation and just giving back to the community you yes. mentioned to us before about angel wings i think it was called oh yeah angel wings so look in uganda there are hundreds hundreds of organizations and not just uganda but in east africa and africa in general um now what grabbed my heart with this little organization angel wings is that it was started by orphans, Uganda orphans, Aww. run and managed by. Lovely. So these are people who have the deep desire to want to help and just mm -hmm. give the young kid a better life. So a lot of these kids in this little orphanage, it's in Lake Bignoni, um, a lot of the tours that you'll go on in Uganda, you have two or three full days in Lake Bignoni. And the reason you have these full days is so that there's flexibility on your gorilla permit. So if there isn't a permit available on this day, at least there's the spare day to get a permit. So that's why there's that flexibility. So then you'll find you'll have a whole free day in the area. Um, and one of the activities you can do in your free time is to visit the Angel Wings um, like orphanage. Mm -hmm. so some of these kids, um, I've been there for a really long time. Some haven't been there for a long time. But the kids that are there are usually from families where there's only one mum um, and dad isn't around or vice versa or mm -hmm. parents um, drowned on Lake Brignoni fishing. That's the biggest, biggest reason why kids are orphaned, our parents mm -hmm. drowning. So my dream would be see somebody to come in and do swimming and water sensitizing for the communities in the area and actually teach them um, water wise just to prevent all these deaths it's incredible the nile river is also equally responsible people don't know how to swim but they'll go out and fish so these kids um or you know lost their parents and grandma or grandpa to raise them but grandma and grandpa live in a village hours hours away deep in the hills so then these kids come to Angel Wings and um, there's no international management involved, if, if I can put it that way. They mm -hmm. do rely 100% on donations, but they don't sit idly and beg. They actually go out and make it work and mm -hmm. they send you feedback with how things are going. And so I donated money and 
over a year, once a month, I would get a WhatsApp going, this is the update, this is what's done, this is where your money's gone, this is what we've done this year, blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. might just need money to pay, you know, for food for the kids and some blankets, bedding, stuff like yeah. that, mm -hmm. and the teachers' salaries. And it's all Ugandan teachers um, and completely Ugandan own and run. And it's just incredible. These kids are just happy. And in school holidays, they will go home to grandma and grandpa or to the mum if they have one. And if they don't, they stay behind like a family and just have the best time ever. And I'm very proud of the team there because recently they saved enough money to buy their own land and just build a bigger um, classrooms and you know, houses for them where they can stay, like little dorms. Mm -hmm. and girls have all dorms. And there was this one girl, like, I don't know why, but, oh, my heart just went up 100% to her. And she didn't have a blanket. She didn't have anything. She had a really, really thin mattress. And I was like, she's the only one in the whole orphanage. She didn't have a blanket. Mm -hmm. So I went and got her one. <laughs> um, and, yeah, or well, I gave money to buy her one. And um, yeah, so, and these kids are just happy. They're just grateful to have an education. Um, unfortunately, in Uganda, well, I guess it's from the old days, but not every child in the family will get to go to school. Usually it's just the firstborn that mm. gets to have an education and the rest will work in the fields. Um, but I think that's also like, you know, they're trying to change that and get more, you know, kids you know, to go to school and all that. But Education. One of the most incredibly beautiful, friendly nations I've ever had the honor and pleasure of meeting. 100%. Yes. You've always said that, like, you know, everywhere you go, it's very, like, community-based. Everybody yeah. is a local, and they're super, super friendly. Like, everybody just... Oh, my gosh, like, you know, you'll be walking around, someone says, hi, oh, come in for chai. Come for chai. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing to you know is so if you go and visit a Ugandan family or someone at their home and they offer you something to drink or eat, please don't decline. It's really offensive. But that I feel like that's anywhere in Africa because yeah, it's a it's the cup of tea or the cake that they're gonna give you, even though it may not taste like the best thing you've had compared to home, for them it's a huge honor that they are mm -hmm. able to provide you with something so that you don't leave the home with an empty belly. You know, uh, speaking about like communities and, and African culture, I remember like when I was in, studying in university, I did Zulu. And the oh, one weekend, we actually went into one of the communities and the, the whole purpose was that you spend the day speaking Zulu so you could practice your language skills. So you speak to the, awesome. the local people in this yeah. little village. And you know, it was so interesting because they put together like a whole I want to say a brass or barbecue for international people and it was in incredible but in their culture it's very specific and the kids are so good because there's tiny little kids and everybody's everyone's a babysitter the kids are all playing with each other in the roads <laughs> and they're tiny children but the guests are so first then the men then the women then the kids and the kids sit patiently and wait you're right men it's are so so different to, I mean we feed uh, you know your parents feed their kids first and then yeah. they go serve themselves it's so mm -hmm. different very different the elderly gets served first 100 percent. and you mm -hmm. know something interesting in uganda if you went to the hospital or the doctors even if it's private you still have to sit and wait you know you wait patiently mm -hmm. and they will always regardless who got there first or last but the elderly patients are always helped first that's good all though they need to be other people you can sit there, there all day place. even if you got there at 8 a.m if there's elderly people, they will be seen to first and you can wait until 5 p.m. or whatever. It's like there's a lot of respect for elderly people. Yeah. I just want I just want to go back on where you said the food and like maybe it's not the best thing that you've had. But <laughs> you said to us, you cannot leave Uganda without having a Rolex. Please explain <laughs> what Rolex is. There's a lot of things you can't leave Uganda without trying. <laughs> I, miss, I miss Uganda immensely. I miss the people. I miss my people there. But um, no, a Rolex is a pretty cool street food. Um, and no, it's not the watch. 
it's, <laughs> it's a slang for rolled eggs. So what this is, is a chapati um, that's been deep fried. For so those who don't know what a chapati is, it's like a flatbread. I guess if you want to say a tortilla, if you want to say like a naan, not quite a naan bread, it's flatter than a naan, but it's more like a deep fried tortilla, you know, wrap if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. And then they make a Spanish omelette. And you can choose if you want to have two egg omelette, a three egg omelette, and for every egg you add on, it's more money. But it's quite cool. You can choose how much protein you want. And then they'll chop up a bit of cabbage and green pepper and tomato and onion, a bit of salt, pepper, whack it up, make a little omelette on the side of the road on a skillet over coals. It's gorgeous. And then Spanish omelette goes in your, the the chapati and it gets rolled up um it's beautiful it's just that's fast food that's street food you can get chicken on a stick meat on a stick and <laughs> it's meat that's cooked over the coals on the side of the road and it's just beautiful there's no fancy marinades or spices just salt and when you're traveling and you're so hungry you don't even need to be hungry it's a long day oh, i want a snack no, no snack is going to taste better than a meat on a stick on a rice. <laughs> but it's an open fire, you know. Like when you cook mm. on like that kind of fire, it's the, the, the smokiness of the barbecue. Oh, <gasps> there's something about it. I think it's an African thing. I don't know. I've had but the other thing you need to try in Uganda. Sorry, I might be yeah. biased here, but peanut sauce. Oh, it's next level. It's next level. <laughs> All this is is raw brown nuts that's been grounded into a paste and then pretty much cooked like a gravy, really. So it is a, it's a savory dish, although when you taste it, it's got an element of sweetness to it. And this you eat over your potatoes or your rice. Um, and it's an incredible, rich protein, beautiful sauce. I'm sure anything is really now I want peanut sauce. <laughs> so anything my daughter misses is peanut sauce. I want a few oh. other but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everything is really fresh though, like the produce and everything. Like the fruit. Oh, I can just, just imagine oh, the bananas. It's I don't know the bananas, the pineapples. They juicy and sweet, sweet, sweet. You know when you have a, you eat a pineapple here, like there's a bit of a tang, you know, and. <laughs> tongue like yeah there's none of that there there's none of that like you know when your tongue gets sore or whatever it, it's not and it's huge like uh, you know, uh, like i would say, I would say um, <laughs> we get pretty close on on the coast i'm on because the queen pineapples that we get are well, like you this is what you were saying That's to me the other day. Yeah. i was like right i need to make a trip up to david to the coast yeah. i just you have to go up to, the Italian to the best fruit in my opinion like when you well, get a lychee off the side of the road in Durban, <laughs> it's the well, best lychee you'll ever have. Yeah, so the fruits and stuff like in Durban, I would say similar to what you're going to get in Uganda. Um, but the flavor maybe, in Uganda is the a banana here, a banana there. It's got so much flavor. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's the humidity and how, like, how it's grown. It must be the climate that's just right for it. Because and also saying, very rich, fertile soil. I mean, mm. it's quite a lot of volcanic um there is a bit of volcanoes in the area, so there's a lot of rich, fertile soil of that. And um, yeah, and I think, a lot of rain. <laughs> I think, um, apart, like just thinking off the top of my head, apart from um, permits and stuff, people traveling to Uganda obviously need visas. Yes. And I know we discussed this quite a bit. And, yeah. Um, how easy is that for most foreigners? It's to get? really easy. Um, best is to pre-apply for your visa you get an e-visa you just go on the Uganda immigration website um some people do get challenges when they're trying to upload their documents and that's simply because it needs to be condensed um so make sure when you upload your documents they are of the certain size that they are required you otherwise it will be rejected until um, so it's the right size but if you have problems just give us a shout mark you know, we can I think we've process. we've done so many now with that that we Yeah, and Lee, you and me, we've us. done this quite a bit, hey. <laughs> Not like guys there. And then of course it does help just having friends on the on yeah. the ground and, that's and like it's, advice. And it's so funny because it's the one thing that people do struggle with is resizing the document properly. And when they send them through to me, 
I now know as well, like because we've had this discussion. I resize yeah. it in the back and I'm like, load these and then they go oh, through. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, remember when the immigration lady resized it for us? I was like, She helped us. She helped us big time because we just without that woman, I don't know. She's she's incredible. Yeah. She was amazing, yeah. And and with that, Uganda obviously um now with Kenya changing to electronic ETAs. Um, you can't do that East Africa visa through them, so you have to still do it through Uganda if you want to go to Rwanda. Just based on my knowledge, it seems that you can still get your East Africa visa. Um, it no longer is applicable for Kenya, so it's just now Uganda and Rwanda. So when you get your East Africa visa, you need to apply for it through the country that you'll be entering in first so in this case most of the time it's uganda so you just pre-apply for your east african visa and this will give you access into rwanda as well and back into uganda um, and having, pardon i think it's worth it giving the opportunity to go into rwanda for the day trip because if you are required to, to have a visa for Rwanda in general, then yes, definitely get it because then when you're in Lake Bignoni and you decide you want to do the day excursion to Rwanda, you do not have to stress and worry about you have it already. Mm -hmm. um, you have the visa. Some countries can get their visas on arrival in Rwanda and some don't need visas. Mm -hmm. As the South Africans, you need to pre-apply. Um, although someone in Rwanda was trying to argue with me with that, and I was like, well, I couldn't do it because I don't have a visa, so maybe things have changed. And that's another thing, yeah. too, is that visa regulations change so much. I mean, for yeah. example, Malawi has changed their regulations three times in the last 12 months. So it's, you know, to keep on top of it, we do try our best, but ultimately, you know, it is... That's not true. The traveler's responsibility to make sure that you get yeah. in your documents. And you know, saying that, there are in each country, um, mm -hmm. there are embassies, but there are also visa agents. So there is a second backup to check. Like we can look at something online, but maybe the information hasn't been updated. So well, if you're this... getting the information from the source, you're better off. No, absolutely. But you've also got to be really careful of the source so that you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. In my opinion, the best source is your local embassy. Mm. That said, I've spoken to a country's embassy in the US and that same country's embassy in South Africa, they both said two different things. So, yeah, yeah I, I guess it's also applicable to your um, nationality because that, you know, some countries have different rules for different nationalities. Um, mm. I wish, you know, I wish we could all just be visa free and not have to worry about that. But at least, oh, well, okay. could be amazing. well, I think that's what Kenya is trying to do now with their ETA. Yeah, um, so it is cheaper than the East African visa. Um, and it is easy. And it is really, really easy. They've made it, they've simplified it. Zambia is mm. on that bandwagon as well, where they're trying to make um, things a lot easier for travelers to come especially after the pandemic um they're just making it really easy for people to travel unfortunately you know africa and many other countries in the world have had some unfavorable characters travel through and abuse the systems and this is why visas are required most of the time um, but I must the say relations between you know the country and yeah. And that's the thing it's it's exactly what you're saying to the relationships but as far as i can see having worked in travel as long as i have mm -hmm. visas to africa actually seem to be the easiest to get out of Af you know as a south african as south africans going into europe or america mm -hmm. there's interviews and stuff for other countries you have to appear in person we don't yeah. do that for africa they're electronic they're online they take it's a few brilliant. Days. and they're not full of nonsense they just like no. sorry we need this document you know, and then yeah. it's just a matter of changing a document, a number, a size, but, uh, but maybe they want a, sign a blue signature, not a black signature. I mean, that's just a hypothetical example. <laughs> but, you know, then you just quickly change it, reset it. Oh, thanks. You know, um, yeah. I'm going to, one of the hardest countries I've ever had to get a visa for, I'm not going to lie, is Bolivia. Not yeah, on yeah. Africa. Yeah. Um, I found getting my American visa when I went to America a lot easier. And that's an interview process in itself. Mm, yeah. You know, Bolivia, it was, it was madness. It was like I was a criminal. 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Why feel do like you want to come like, here? What is your purpose like? Well, so Africa, the, countries love your people. the countries we mainly sell, they're very open to tourism, so they don't want to make the process too hard. But you know, okay. obviously, like you said, they rely on tourism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it, Mishka. Like tourism is a huge income, you know, to boost economies. A lot of people rely on it. Mm -hmm. uh, funnily enough, I had this conversation with some. A local people in Uganda one day and they're like well why are we bothered with tourism we don't get benefits off it I was like maybe not direct in your hand mm -hmm. I said but look in the village that we live in these campsites and rough comings whatever are attracting the tourism here and they will then go and buy a Rolex from your chapati stand they will go <laughs> Here and they're oh, they're supporting your Those local places. economy. Mm -hmm. um, that is how they are supporting it. And I didn't think of it like that. They were like, but I'm not getting any handout in my hand. I said, it's all about you, my dude. It's about everyone in your village being looked after as an economy. Mm -hmm. that everyone can survive one way or the other by the little bit that is coming in. You know, I said, but if you're going to go and do something to counteract that, then nobody's going to come and nobody's going to benefit. Um, you know, so it is a good thing. It's amazing that you say that because I actually saw a comment on um, a post the other day. It wasn't ours, thankfully, but it was a comment where it was obviously an international person and she said, is it necessary for Africa to have, you know, so many different types of travel? You've got luxury lodges, you've got four, <laughs> five star, etc. Like, is it necessary for them to have this type of things? And the main answer that lots of people gave them is yes, because number one, Africa is a musty destination. Everybody needs to see it. But on top of that is that that's the way we make most of our income as a, as, as a continent. Like Afri everybody wants to see Africa and that is the way the communities in those areas make their living basically. Like if you go to Kruger, for example, Almost every guy that's there, or every tracker that's there, has probably lived in that area. Mm. And was like, yes. from the time that they were a child into that field that they're in now. Yeah. You're 100%. Yeah, you're correct. So, a lot of the um, guides who are employed are from the area and they grew up and, I mean, pick their brains with stories. I used to and, do that to the guides in the Okavanga Delta, the stories I used to get out of them. I, I think the, the biggest thing with what you just said, Mishka, with the different types of accommodation, like everyone deserves the opportunity to experience Africa, but not everyone can afford the high-end lodge, you know? Yes. So that's yes. why there are different levels. There's camping, there's something for everyone mm -hmm. so that you can get those, well, I mean, you don't get wildlife experiences like Africa anywhere else in the world. And I think we spoke about this when we were away as a team. It's when you come to Africa, you get that, like primal coming home feeling like it's mm. a very humbling experience yeah from the people to the wildlife like it's incredible and i mean you have left south africa so many times and mm. i've come straight back <laughs> i can't i've tried to live overseas and i keep coming back here it's just I, I love it so much and and to the point where my entire family live overseas but i've chosen to stay here because this feels like home it doesn't feel like home when i try to live overseas and, I and don't get me wrong, I love Europe. I'll take a European holiday any day. Like, I love it. <laughs> but it's, it's very different living here. Yeah. We're very, very lucky. We are extremely, extremely lucky. Um, another thing that I just want to bring up that I'm sure not many people know that Lee helped me discover the other day is milk bars. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is so epic. I don't know about it either. I'm like... I love that. Me, did you watch the video? What, I watched the video, um, but I want you to tell us about it because I feel like you're just very animated and you will explain it so well. <laughs> it is so cool. Like, have you yeah. ever? I know, total accident how I came across it and I was like, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the world. But Rwanda, instead of like the guys going down to, to have be a beer at the local pub or bar, they go to a milk bar <laughs> and you can choose between just a regular glass of milk or like a fermented style. So we call that Mars. Yeah, but they probably call it a different thing in Rwanda. Um, so you can choose the type of milk you want. And 
it's so ex it's so like exciting and different and they're everywhere but they are actually slowly dying out because they're becoming less and less popular and obviously it's easier to obtain milk at local supermarkets and things so people probably aren't going to the bars as much but all i can tell you is i'm so determined to have a little experiment and get different types of milk and <laughs> do like a tasting oh my gosh <laughs> yes. i would do that i'm gonna do it like her husband saying, hey, honey, I'm just going out with the boys to the milk bar. <laughs> but the you bar. know what I love about the milk bar is that they're actually serving the milk in beer jugs. Did anybody notice what? that? Yes. The beer mugs. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. And the guy had one of each because he's like, I want to taste both types of milk. And he's not like, I'm lactose intolerant, but I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but funny you say that because the fermented milk probably wouldn't affect him too much with his lactose intolerance. Because yeah, it's got the good cultures, you know. That's it. And there's yeah. most likely you can choose from goat milk, cow's milk, sheep milk. Oh, that's you just added another element. Point. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to go to today. I think we have to go to Rwanda. I did do a city truly, you and we go, oh yes. Milk bar hopping. Milk I'm gonna hopping. do like a I'm gonna do a, my poor boyfriend. I'm gonna do a blind tasting with milk and I'm gonna be like, taste each of these and tell me what you like. <laughs> Please film it. I will. It'll be genius. It'll be really interesting because I just saw the other day, like, I'm still trying to reculture myself coming back to South Africa. <laughs> They're actually selling unpasteurized milk in the shop. That's, it must be a fall because. Yeah. So I found this really quite interesting. I was like, okay. Um, you can. You know, like in Uganda was amazing because the farmer would come around every morning with a milk in the milk cans, you know, like from the 70s. You know, <laughs> I guess in Europe and in some places they still use it. Sorry. Um, but, yeah, he'll come on his little motorbike with his fresh milk and then pour it out <laughs> for you. And then, you know, it's the fresh and then the cream that sits on the top of the milk and it just sits. Fresh milk is amazing. Here in the shops, I just don't know what's all in it. So I guess yeah. that's a good point. Let's get to run now. Milk tasting is really going to happen. Okay. <laughs> we'll make you get a thing. Um, just another yeah. question. Uh, in terms of obviously overlanding and tours, what would you say, like, would you? Do your gorilla trek, would you prefer to do it in the beginning, in the middle? Like, what's the best way to include a gorilla trek in your tour? So, there's a bit of a psychology around this one. Um, and either you can do it at the beginning of your tour, or you can do it at the end of your tour. <laughs> so, we have different styles, different lengths. We have the big trips, 64, 58 day trips. And then we have the shorter ones, four days, seven days, 14 days. Um, and majority of the itinerary. So, let's just start with a two week trip, you know, Nairobi, starting and ending in Nairobi, that does a little bit of Kenya and does Uganda and the gorillas. If you look at the itineraries, it's quite interesting to note that the gorilla activity is right at the end. And there's a bit of a reason behind that, because gorilla trekking is going to be one of the, the top three highlight exciting things that you're going to be seeing and doing on your trip. It is like the thing. And sometimes what can happen is if that is the only highlight that people are really, really just like, oh, my gosh, I can't wait to do it. Once they've mm -hmm. done it, everything else just fades in comparison now i don't say that everything else doesn't isn't as amazing it's just that the hype is so about the gorilla trekking like once they've tracked then they sort of like lose interest in everything else because what else could beat gorilla trekking so <laughs> you know that sort of stuff but if you're going to start your trip in nairobi then i would recommend you do the uganda and then of course the gorillas and then enjoy the trip south what's cool about doing your trip south is that as more south you go so things become more westernized and you have more supermarkets that are more stocked with different stuff and mm -hmm. you, know, you have flushing toilets that will work more than east africa you'll have electricity you might have faster wi-fi whatever the case may be is and then ending it in incredible cape town with a bash but if you're doing it a lot of people would then do it north 
but then the gorilla trek should be the absolute last thing you do because um I mean, once you've done that, it's like the grand finale of your tour. Um, and But yeah, I guess it's also the mindset, um, you know, with the gorilla trekking and all the other things that you want to enjoy. But mm -hmm. the other thing to, you know, that probably would contradict what I'm saying now is that you also probably want to just do the gorilla trekking first before you go, you know, spraining your ankles or getting yeah, sick yeah. or something along the way that would then prevent you from doing the track. So if you started your tour earlier, you went fishing with Canon, I don't know, you climbed Kilimanjaro, you slept, you sprained your ankle a week before you're supposed to go gorilla trekking because you did Kili first. In that case, I would do gorillas first. And then do Kilimanjaro. If you do, you can yeah. get somebody to carry you, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, if you have like a thousand dollars lying around for someone, <laughs> go for it. But you know, Mane, it's like it's so difficult to say because I think some people who haven't experienced some of the other things, it really wouldn't matter what order they do. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I had time. It, it's it's the mindset, I guess, you know, yeah. and it also depends like what you want to get out of your tour what is it like everyone has got their own little agenda going on and everyone's got their own little reasons for coming out you know exactly um, um i've had quite a few women and men having a midlife crisis that just ended their marriage sold up freaking everything and decided to travel for three months look <laughs> so I I quite a few of those i'm not gonna lie it's like that's it everything's become too much i'm becoming a nomad sometimes you need to the break you just 100 percent. i think yes. overland is the best place to come for that little situation i'm not it's gonna really lie because you're surrounded with incredible people that just have the zest for life who are open-minded have the flexible nature and that just go with the flow i mean you've just mm. come back come out of a situation where it was this way that way the next way and you just need a little bit of breathing space come to africa it will heal <laughs> <laughs> one thing is you may never leave um when you come to africa that has happened before as well where people are like, oh, i just need a break and then they just never leave it's okay. Very welcoming people. It's like a little bug in your skin, and then yeah, it's you forever. It's a love. It's a it's a, it's a love, heavy love relationship. If you come to Africa, just know it's a start of a very long, expensive addiction because you're really <laughs> coming back and coming. The back. number of passengers I deal with that when they get home say, "Are we planning our next trip to here or to there or next time we want to Yeah, Africa, it's not so beautiful. You know? All the time. It's the best so, for me. That's the best because I'm like, yes, they're the best time. Like uh, when they come back, like it's a good feeling. Biggest compliment. It's 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 such a good feeling. Like I'm I'm like a kid in the candy store. <laughs> um, last question. It could be answered yeah. by both of you. Um, <laughs> what's the most interesting, compelling? inspiring story that you've had from a past traveler who's done a good enough trek or any sort of trek that's a good one i was actually going to say earlier i had a client that did a gorilla trek um and and elderly clients elderly they i mean i would say they're probably not at the fitness level i think they walk enough so that was mm -hmm. hard for them and their highlight or her, her highlight from their trip was seeing lions in the Serengeti, but just because the vehicle got so close to the lions. And I think she just really loved lions, mm. you know? Mm. So like that was such a highlight for her. So I, that's what I was saying when you're saying like, it depends on the person and how open they are, because it, some people are obsessed with elephants. And I mean, you come to Africa, you're going to see a lot of them. Like if you go through Botswana and you, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of elephants. But yeah. is one elephant too many? No, absolutely not. They're amazing. <laughs> exactly. And you know, Lee, it's sort of like, yeah, so many game drums, I'm done with game drums. I said, but every day is different. You're gonna mm -hmm. see something different. Although it's an elephant, like he might be doing something different in a different area, like um, you know, but um I've 
had so many, I can't point to one. But the only thing that I can honestly think of now is one of my favorite travelers. Um, I actually miss chatting with them, you know, like when we're emailing our travelers, like we get to know our clients. And yeah, I sometimes get emotionally involved because I just want the best. And then what's really epic is when they're sending me photos while they're on tour. Yes. But yeah, look what I saw this morning. I was like, oh. <laughs> and then I literally get so jealous. We shared with the whole team and then we get sidetracked from work because we're all discussing what our clients saw in the Delta that morning. I'm just like the one lion sighting. I was like, jealous much. <laughs> jealous much. <laughs> you know, and anyway, he sent me a message going, and here we are, gorillas. And, um, everyone's emotional and crying and of course I'm a man I'm not allowed to cry so I'm just smiling <laughs> you know whatever next thing this the silver back just lets rip the loudest fart through the forest <laughs> can they laugh because don't you have to be like really well, this is, they're all trying to kill <laughs> but I think the guide was like we can't hold it in. We have to laugh. Like, what the fudget? You anyway, it was, been the gorilla. But you could just imagine everyone's just so quiet and, and everyone's trying to be so serious. The next thing you just hear, <laughs> really laugh through the forest. Like, it's like breaking the ice. So what else are you supposed to do? But um, no, like I've had various um, encounters and stories, but that was quite funny. That was that was quite a good one. Mm. I think that this has been a really awesome chat, ladies. Do you guys have anything else that you guys want to add in? Always. Um, here for days if I did. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to just thank you. Yeah. I think um, off the back of what you said, uh, Minette, like yeah. one of the things, we're not just here to, to book the holidays. Like we are genuinely interested and we actually do really want to see the pictures. So, you know, it's you not something we just say, you right. And us. Because we get really excited about that. Too. Because we, like, we get FOMO. Like, I just had um, a group of friends. They were five. And they did, like, Uganda. And then they did a two-week Tanzanian Kenya trip. And um, these guys were just the best. And I miss them immensely because they included me in their safari while they were on safari <laughs> and every day I would get updates and it honestly felt like I was with you them. Know, doing you were there. Them. and I was like, I couldn't wait for the next day's updates like what happened last night what did you hear you know I'm just like I was just like because I know we know what you know our travelers are going to experience and I just I have found I want to know I, I wish I was a fly on the wall to see they look with them. Them. <laughs> and they see an elephant for the first time. Honestly, I can't explain to you the frustration that I'm not there to see the look on their face, the pleasure, mm. the joy of seeing the sunrise over the dunes or seeing a lion for the first time. Like the, those emotions. Oh man, I get a kick out of that. Yeah. yeah it is the best. It's the best feeling. Yeah. It's not just something that we say, we generally do want to know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if we could, we would probably put ourselves in your suitcase too. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I go with every day. Imagine. <laughs> then we're like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> cool. Last thing that I just want to touch on is that we do have Black Friday deals that are still valid, bookable until I think what the second of December. So you've just got today and Monday, basically. But there will probably be more. We do have others that are going. So if you guys have any questions, any plans to travel, I'm sure all of you do. <laughs> Please yeah. let, up, let us know if you're looking for something. And we are here to help you every step of the way. Definitely. Super Thank excited. You so awesome. Thank you, ladies, so much. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you so much, Thanks, Bye. everyone.